What's up, guys? It's yo boy I'm the sensei back with, the boys. Reborn as the Homelander. Part 2. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Josh, CNN. The middle-aged reporter said, briskly. Will you, as chairman of the board for Vought, take responsibility for soldier boy running loose and the over two dozen dead? What do you have to say to their families? Ashley was broken from her thoughts as she saw John's jaw clench and the sight of his right eye ever so slightly twitch. Josh, CNN, John repeated calmly. You want me to take responsibility? He shook his head slightly as if in disbelief. Why? So you can put on your headline Vought Chairman Kills. Homelander responsible for dozens dead. His voice was rising, she could feel the annoyance in his tone. You know in 84 when Soldier Boy died I was 3 years old. I was fucking toddler and you want me to take responsibility for something that happened when I was a toddler. What kind of question is that? Anxiety was bundling in her chest. She could see that Starlight was also taken aback by his aggressiveness. Everything had been going well so far, he and Starlight had even come prepared in the morning, and with the PR team they went over a bunch of scenarios for an hour before the conference. I was three years old when it happened, as soon as we found out it's soldier boy we told the public. What kind of question is that really? I was a toddler when he died, where were you in CNN? Why didn't you investigate his death? Why aren't you asking the CIA that covered it up to take responsibility? His tone was getting louder, he had stopped addressing Josh specifically and looked upon the whole crowd. This is what you do in the media to get clicks and make headlines. You try to divide us to make us afraid, you try to blame others to conceal the truth. None of you are asking why this is happening now. Isn't it a bit convenient that I take down a bunch of Vought executives, threaten the profits of the elite, try to do good and clean up the corruption and cronyism that Vought's been involved, and suddenly, suddenly Soldier Boy comes back from the dead after 40 fucking years. Oh and look at that he's just conveniently out there killing supers, helped by ex-CIA operatives. He said with exaggerated air quotes. Geez I wonder if maybe I should question that, but no. Let me put the blame on the man that's actually trying to do something about it. Homelander paused briefly. The crowd was aptly silent both in wonderment and shock. You know at my birthday special I told you there were powerful actors working in the background, controlling even people like me, the deep state, but did you believe me? No, of course not. You called me crazy, you said I was dog whistling to racists, to fucking 4chan or something, but here we are just a few weeks later I challenge Vought, and the elite and suddenly soldier boy is back from dead killing Americans not giving a shit about collateral damage. Unfucking believable. He said shaking his head. And you want me to take responsibility? Well guess what Josh, I will take responsibility. He said suddenly and loudly. It's not like anyone else will do it. He said pausing sharply. You the media, don't give a shit, you don't report on truth, just whatever will get you more clicks and followers. You're not taking responsibility. He paused sharply. But I will. He said looking at the crowd, directly into the live cameras. Because sure as shit the government won't, not with the CIA involved. They don't give a shit about Americans dying, but I do. Ashley couldn't help but be taken in by his rant, the whole crowd was really, it almost sounded truthful. Your elected officials won't, hell some corrupt senators probably okayed the whole fucking thing. They simply don't care about you. The rule of law is meant for you not for them. They don't care. He paused sharply once again, as if giving time for the audience to absorb. But I do. He said firmly. I still care about truth, justice and the American way. It hurts me to see fellow Americans dead, in pain, being lied to and cheated, especially when it's by those who are supposed to look out for their best interests. He continued. I still believe in our country and our people, our way of life, in doing the right thing. He paused again this time looking directly at Josh. 
So yes Josh, I will take responsibility, because no one will, because it's the right thing to do. Ashley saw him shake his head while looking down. To everyone at home, I'm sorry this is happening, I'm sorry you have lost your loved ones. I'm sorry you have been cheated and lied to because so have I. I promise you I will do everything I can to stop Soldier Boy, to prevent more deaths. I will do it because it's the right thing to do, I will do it for me, for you, for our people and our country. I will bring back truth, justice and the American way. He said banging his fist on the podium accentuating each word. He paused for a moment, then simply walked off the podium briskly, his body language exuding disappointment, leaving the shocked crowd in silence. As she exchanged looks with a worried starlight a sense of dread overwhelmed her, while all her thoughts were bubbling up in a volcano of anxiety and screaming at 100 miles an hour. Fuck. Interesting press conference, a very passionate speech. Martin said as he walked in the seven meeting room. I really need a fucking office. I thought, but it was pretty good optics to be in the large meeting room, now with the door open to everyone, not to use of course, just to have access to me and the seven. Don't you start as well, I've already gone through this with Starlight, Ashley and the PR team. They are already running damage control. I calmly stated. Oh, I think they will be surprised there were some that quite liked your little speech. Some would even agree with you. I stared at him and couldn't help but let the corner of my mouth rise up a bit in a small smile. I'm counting on it but enough of that. You are here because you have updates on our two subjects. I do. He said taking a seat on the left side of the table. We have collected all the samples we can. Red is almost recovered we should be able to wake her up whenever you want. Black is in rougher shape, but we managed to get everything as well. Amazing specimen I have to say. I nodded. Ideally I would like Red to be kept under for another day or two if you can make something up, it's fine if you don't, but I do want to be there when she wakes up. I said firmly. As for Black is she even going to make it? If you think you got everything you need then as soon as she's stable let her go. She has people looking for her. The spazzy little French fellow? He asked and I nodded. Yes, he's a resourceful little one, very dangerous. I don't want him to start kidnapping our people out of spite. He'll be coming by today plus Starlight will flip her shit when she finds out about Black being here. I leaned back in my chair, letting the annoyance surface. Black will make it, it's really amazing even in her state of regeneration and durability is above the average human. She could hold the key to everything. He said and I could feel the excitement in his voice. Good. Make sure she does. I really don't want to deal with that little shit. He might not be able to hurt me, but he'll go after every single one of you, if anything happens to his little cur. God his accent is so annoying. I said annoyed. Frenchie was a vengeful and creative little cunt, and I had no doubts that he would kill every single scientist that works for or has worked with Vought. It would set me back years and years on my plans. Kill them all. Yes Echo, yes. That is always an option. I could kill him and Kamiko right now, chuck them in a volcano where no one would find them, but knowing my luck, or I should say Homelander's luck somehow Annie would find out then she'd start blabbing her fucking mouth, so I'd have to kill her, then I'd have to kill Meve. But I didn't really want to go through that hassle. Not only because of the obvious attachments of Homelander to Meve and my horniness for Starlight, but also because they were fucking killing it in ratings, revenues, brand recognition and reputation. I was about to embark Vought on an unprecedented spending spree, and those two were cash printing machines. You wouldn't believe the endorsement deals we got for Homelight alone. Merchandise was flying off the shelves. Pure American brand. No, I needed my little cash machines for the money and respectability they brought to Vought, the seven and me. I court the extremes of the spectrum, continue building my base while they soften the blowback by simply being there. Actually that's why I'm here. Martin said, his face suddenly sporting a reptilian smile. We have to dose her with V, and I want you there to stop any brisk reactions. I looked at him curiously. I thought you said she was going to make it? I knew from the show that Kamiko was going to want to be super again, so I was going to offer her a dose of V anyway. It would stop Starlight from snooping around and find the notes on 24 volt. That's not to say that I didn't already talk with Martin and our security team. We upped the security around the labs. No more notes on the effects of 24 volt, no warning to Huey and Butcher. 
The little shit will die within 12 months, and my hands will be squeaky clean. She is, but we were successful in phase 2, my eyes immediately widened, and I reflexively inhaled for both he continued. I leaned back in my chair and couldn't help but let out a low whistle. You're kidding right? I mean what are the odds of that? Both? That was basically a shot in the dark, pie in the sky. Martin shrugged. Pure coincidence, it was the right time. But don't get your hopes up this is still uncharted territory it might fail halfway through, the rate was quite high the last time. Deep down in my gut I felt something stirring, a heat was rising, enveloping me, excitement bubbling, as if every cell of my body knew the winds of fate were changing. This was it, the beginning of a new world. Oh, I have a feeling it will be a resounding success, beyond everything we could imagine. I couldn't help but sport a wicked smile as I responded. Just don't blame me if it doesn't. Martin said reluctantly. Of course, it's all experimental after all. I said to give him confidence. Now this is what we are going to do. We'll set her up in the vault and I'll inject her with V. If she has any adverse reactions to being there or the V, I'll stop her or knock her out if she needs medical treatment. If she recovers I'll escort her out and put her in an Uber, then she won't be our problem anymore. What about monitoring her condition in the future? He asked. Don't worry if it's successful one way or another we will find out, and if not well no harm done. Martin thought about it for a moment. It's a shame we won't be able to monitor her and get more data. You never know how it might help out in the future. Trust me, both her and her little French shit are vertically challenged killing machines. She won't like being poked and prodded. She'll try to brutally kill everyone then be used as a science experiment. The hassle of dealing with them is simply not worth it. I stated firmly. Martin let out a big sigh and I saw him deflate a bit. Very well as you wish. I tugged and pulled gently as my fingers closed one by one in a controlled and firm motion around the nipple. The burst of hot liquid hitting the bucket was music to my ears. It didn't take long before there was enough of the white foamy milk accumulated that I was compelled to drink it. Warm, slightly sweet and fresh on my lips. Fucking echo, fucking homelander instincts, fucking milk fetish. After stuffing a scared and confused Kamiko in a taxi, I went to the Robert Singer rally at the farm in upstate New York. Singer, a Democrat and Secretary of Defense, was in cahoots with Vaught, and Homelander was supposed to endorse him. And I did endorse him, anti-corruption, trusted friend, honest man, and all that bullshit the crowds loved to hear. I talked him up and gave a watered-down version of my speech this morning. These salt-of-the-earth rural types literally ate it all up, the ignorant fucks. The American way what a joke. Like these morons would have any idea what that meant, what it actually took to keep America on top, a fucking joke. I shouldn't be too hard on them it's not their fault really, the shit education system and good fortune of our country has made them fat and ignorant. That worked to my advantage let them all project their version of the American way on me. Still I was here for a second purpose, Victoria Newman. She was here and I was hoping she would approach me, unfortunately with my future knowledge and Homelander's inherited fetish, I felt almost compelled to come and indulge in the sweet white nectar from this beautiful creature. Moo. Yes Echo, we pet the gentle grass doggo. Fucking Homelander my hearing picked up the confident footsteps long before she entered the barn. Fresh milk? I asked pushing the bucket in her direction before she could say anything. It's safe if you drink it straight from the cow quickly enough while it's warm, you don't have to boil it. I could tell she was thrown off her rhythm. No, thanks. Ah, more for me then. I said and gulped the rest of it. Congressman Newman, how can I help you? I put the bucket down and stood to face her. She approached me until she was within arm's length. I have to give it to her very balsy. That's one hell of a speech you gave. I'll be surprised if he doesn't jump in the polls and the press conference this morning well half my team thinks you've gone mad, and the other half thinks you should run for president. Funny, that's what my PR team said as well. I replied. Now you're not here to give me media tips are you? So what do you want? I think we can help each other. She started with a sly smile. You and me we could make a great team. Her long curved eyelashes batting at me, he big eyes looking up gently. With your support we could do great things, I could pass the education support bill, and I could back you up on, ugh. Like a cobra attacking my right hand shot up faster than she could react and grabbed her neck, 
thumb squeezing her voice box. The fucking audacity you have. I said rage building up inside of me. You fail with starlight, trying to turn her against me. Her breathing intensified and I could feel her super strength gripping my forearm, not that it would do her any good, as my fingers tightened like a vice around her neck. What you didn't think I would know about that, about your little girl power scheme. And now you come to me peddling your bullshit, and I'm supposed to stay and listen like a good little idiot? Blink twice if I'm wrong. Her eyes went big in shock, well bigger, since she was already shocked by me grabbing her, as I finished repeating her line. My rage was sweltering now. I felt energy building up inside of me. Bend her over. Mount her. Yes Echo, no, wait, what the fuck? I mean yes, sure, she had full curves, plush lips and delicious looking matcha skin and god damn it, I'm at half mast already. You need someone you can trust. She said. What? Someone like you? I got rid of Edgar for you, that cost me a lot. I'm proposing a strictly transactional relationship. You help me out with one small favor and I help you. She pulled out the piece of paper with Ryan's address. I let go of her, took a look at the address and then at her. If this is what I think it is then I'll help you with your little problem. You'll be VP in no time. I said with a cold smile. Her eyes narrowed in suspicion. How did you I cut her off? Oh please, ambitious, outspoken and strong-headed, like it's hard to tell you want to be the first woman president. I said leaning in, her scent, a mixture of sweat, hormones and lavender filled my nostrils, damn she barely came up to my chin. Come to my penthouse tonight, midnight, I have a new proposition, we'll talk details then. I finished and walked off leaving her confused. It honestly took everything I had to control myself and not take her then and there. Fucking echo urges, this is why I can't let him indulge too much, it leads to me doing stupid shit. Whether she'll show up tonight I'll have to wait and see. Now, I had the rest of the day to attend meetings and respond to email. Fucking hell, no rest for the wicked. I was in the middle of cooking for my hopeful adventure tonight when I received the call from Soldier Boy. If this is really you then you have some nerve calling me. I said annoyed. No pathetic scared meandering from me. The situation's changed. I thought we should have a conversation. Did it? I asked rhetorically. Are you ready to surrender? You know you got lucky that little shit teleported me away. He responded with his little trip down memory lane of how he beat his meat into a cup. Turns out Vogelbaum made a kid, born spring 1981. A boy. He said. You know what the bitch of it is, if they had just kept me around, I would have let you take the spotlight. What father wouldn't want that for his son? He finished. Now I knew this was coming so I was prepared for it, but Homelander's stupid feelings still bubbled up within me like a sledgehammer, and I felt my eyes tear up. Fuck you Echo, not this time. I pushed all that shit right back down where it came. Is that so? I said slowly. If it's true that does change things. Why don't you come by the tower tomorrow evening, let's say after 8. On the west side there will be an emergency stairwell door left unlocked, away from the cameras. I finished firmly. Oh, and do bring that cunt William Butcher with you. I have a surprise for him. I finished and ended the conversation. A big risk I was taking but hey, YOLO, well in my case it's twice. Besides a hero needs a big final battle. It was a quarter to midnight when Victoria showed up to the penthouse. She was greeted by low lighting accentuated by the barely audible thumping of the lo-fi jazz and hip-hop mixture and a set dining table. I hope you're hungry. I've made risotto and pecan salmon. It's a little late for dinner isn't it? She asked looking around. The ambience was throwing her off. I didn't know you could cook. I snorted and rolled my eyes. Everyone can cook. You just have to follow the instructions. It's not that hard. Please have a seat we have a lot to discuss. As she sat down I couldn't help but take her appearance in. She had changed from the business-like pantsuit into a dark blue evening dress, adorned by little colorful butterflies that hanged on her in just the right way to accentuate her curves. You said you had a proposal? She said jumping into business right away. I took the wine bottle off the table and poured some into our glasses. Business right away no patience. And here I cooked a nice meal as a peace offering. I said with my best sincere smile. She didn't look impressed or phased by it. Cut the crap. She said firmly. You think I'll fall for this romantic bullshit like one of your groupies? 
Tell me what you want already. I sighed, took a giant gulp of wine and leaned back in my chair. Fine, you want backing for your political aspiration I'll give you Vought, the seven and my full support. Education, transportation, environment hell even reasonable gun control, we'll back you up, financially, reputationally, whatever you need. We'll turn you into the President of the United States, the most powerful woman in the world. I paused for her to absorb what I just said. We support you, I support you and in return you and the US government will support me in my ventures. What I plan for the new direction of Vought will require substantial funding, hundreds of billions, the backing of an entire nation. I said with a cold smile. She looked confused and concerned. What the hell are you planning? Oh, don't worry, it's something quite neutral when it comes to the political area. It won't step on anyone's toes. You see I'm taking Vought into space. She just blinked at me. What? Space, you know the big empty and dark thing that's all around our planet? I said as if she was dumb and I could see that she was annoyed immediately. Yes, I know what space is. What do you mean Vought is going into space? It's exactly that. Vought is entering the space race. SpaceX, Blue Space and a bunch of other companies are already doing good work in that area. Vought seeks to surpass them and to do that we'll need funding, lots and lots of funding. I said and took another swing of the wine. She just looked at me trying to take in what I was saying. You're insane. I smiled. So I'm told. She just shook her head in disbelief. You want me to spend hundreds of billions on a vanity project, just so you can have a rocket measuring contest with a bunch of asshole billionaires? Money that could be better spent here on education and infrastructure? Come now, we spend over 700 billion on defense every year, more than a trillion and a half in the past 20 years on Afghanistan alone, what's a few hundred thrown to create a new American dream, a new goal to give people hope to make people dream? I paused briefly and stood. Just imagine it now, science and education back at the forefront of the American psyche. I said staring out the window at the night sky. My supervision allowing me to see the stars in a way that no mortal could, little puffy clouds of white floating in deep blue black. Though I haven't yet pushed it to its limits, partially out of fear of what I would see, even Homelander's memories were too jumbled to understand what he saw when it came to maxing out his vision, part of me understood why Superman saw things differently. How could I not when I could casually focus on the minute details of an object a mile away, colors jumping and vibrantly dancing, their rhythm enticing me to move past them as if the Red Sea parting for Moses. New technologies developed with a purpose and not with profit in mind I continued, my voice whimsical and eager, I was letting hope rise up within me of what I could do, what I could accomplish men and women united under one goal, pushing our boundaries to explore the new frontier and beyond. I paused and turned back to her. It's what we Americans were made to do. We are explorers, always have been since the inception of our kind. She looked at me with big brown eyes, plush lips partially parted. I let the silence build between us. I outlined my vision the ball was in her court to respond. You're really serious, aren't you? You actually believe this? She said as more of a statement. I do. I simply stated. But I'm not naive, I know this isn't something that can be accomplished in a few years or all at once. I extended my hand for her to take it. She instinctively did and I pulled her up. I'm not proposing a transactional relationship here, I'm proposing a legacy. I brought her closer so she was facing the large windows overlooking the city and the night sky. You want to be the most powerful woman in the world, together we can accomplish that. I want to change the world, together we can accomplish that. I finished saying. She didn't say anything, just stared out at the sprawling lights of the city, the ocean and the glittering stars. Impressive speech she finally said. Is this the part where I'm wooed enough by your grand plans, I fall into your strong arms and you kiss me? She asked with a playful smirk. If we are going to conspire and get in bed with each other, I thought it would be good that we also got to know one another a bit, to build trust of course before we embark on this journey together, hence dinner I said smugly, and pointed at the food now going cold. She took a glance at the table and then at the city. Her right hand went to her back and moved the zipper in a smooth practiced motion. With a slight shuffle her dress fluttered to the ground, leaving her only in her black silky lingerie. Her stature was confident and her eyes were staring into mine. How about we skip directly to dessert? She stated confidently whipped cream. 
Oh yes Echo she will get lots of whipped cream tonight. The thin layer of grey clouds blanketing the Minnesota sky served as a foreboding warning to the events that were fated to happen today. This was the big day, the confrontation with Soldier Boy and Butcher the final battle so to speak. I should be feeling weary, concerned, anxious, but instead all I felt was satisfied. Played that bitch like an accordion yes we did echo, yes we did. Good thing Victoria was a soup, a decently strong one at that, otherwise I would have crushed her spine. There's one thing to have the memories of fucking someone like Stormfront and actually fucking a soup the first time. Let's just say control tends to slip in the moment. I'm not going to pretend it was some romantic moment or anything like that, overwhelmed by our emotions or some other such nonsense. We used each other. She was a smart woman, she had come prepared for that eventuality, and apparently when you are a secret soup and a young good-looking congresswoman, it's not exactly easy or good for optics to be hooking up with people. Once the dam was loose she drank with much gusto. We even had the dinner, talked over some more details about our plans, and went again because why not she was already there. Part of me wanted to fall back on old habits and lazy in bed this morning, but Homelander's instincts basically compelled me to go see Ryan. Our son. I inwardly sighed. Yes our son. Your son, my son, what's the difference now really? Doesn't matter really he's going to be the one of the most powerful beings on the planet, so I needed him to at least not dislike daddy dearest. I saw him sporting a baseball mitt on his left hand preparing to throw with his right. Huh, is he playing catch with himself, did he figure out super speed? And I guess not, the ball went far, really far, but he stayed in place. Hopefully it will land in some field instead of someone's brain. Whoa. I knew your fastball would come in sooner or later I said with an excited smile as I gently landed. Stay away from him. Mallory said bursting outside in her awkward gait. How the hell was she ever a baddest agent and former director of the CIA? It's okay. I'm not here to cause trouble, hurt anyone. Just want to see my son. I replied firmly and casually. That of course did nothing to change the look of desperation off of her face. And I had a heck of a time trying to find you, buddy, I I paused slightly and glanced at Mallory. Even had to get a big important congresswoman to help me. She been treating you all right? I asked him while letting my face relax its features in a cold stare at her. And Grace? That instantly irked me, and I felt a twitch in my features. Yay she's nice. And Grace? I pushed down the bubbling feelings rising up inside me. Okay. She may be nice Ryan, but I don't think Aunt Grace knows what is best for you. She has good intentions, I'm sure, but she's not like us. Like you and me. I fought the urge to laser her in half while I heard a ruffle around for her phone. I can hear those clumsy fingers of yours slipping around on that screen. Get rid of it now. I ordered her. I have half a mind to laser that hand off if she doesn't comply. Do it? I really want to but then that would set Ryan against me again. Luckily for me she throws it to the ground. Listen, Ryan. Your mom, she wanted what's best for you. And so do I. You have a real family. I'm your father, I understand what you're going through, the changes that are happening to you. I went through the same thing myself. He looks at me confused. But aren't you mad at me dot 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 for what I did? Time to do some goddamn parenting. No, no. Of course not. You know that wasn't your fault right? I pause and let him absorb what I just said. In his mind he is still blaming himself for the death of his mother and probably Stormfront. I slowly walk to him and stopped a foot or two before him. Son, when you are as strong as we are, accidents happen, things break, and sometimes they are the things you love the most. I pause as he looks at me pensive. But that's all it is an accident, and nobody knows that better than me. Nobody. I said firmly. And what happened with Stormfront and with your mother, that, that I sighed heavily paused and looked at him. That was my fault. Not yours. You were put in a position no child should ever be put in, and it's all my fault. I said pensively. I was angry, I was upset that you were being kept from me, and Stormfront, well I wish I could say I didn't see the signs of who she was, and what she was doing, but that would be lying, and I don't want to lie to you. She was, well, we were and I sighed again. Complicated. He looked conflicted I could tell. I reached my hand out to put it on his shoulder he flinched out of reflex but accepted it. 
As you grow older and turn into a man you will find that things aren't always black and white, and that what our heart desires and the actions we take aren't always noble or right. Now this is no excuse of course, not for my actions, not hers and not the position you were put in. Don't blame yourself, blame me, you were put in an impossible position, and you did the best that you could in the moment. It is not your fault, it was a simple accident. Do you understand? His eyes went up and down briefly, and I saw a glint of tears, before he nodded. And son, I want you to know that as your father I will always love you, I will try to be there for you no matter what happens. And I'm not going anywhere. I will always be here. I finished firmly. He looked at me and his lower lip and chin quivered, and he lunged at me into a hug. Poor kid, blaming himself for the death of his mother. Considering he was my kid, Becca and Vaught were absolute morons for not teaching him about his powers. It was an accident waiting to happen. Fucking Jonah, went the opposite of what he did to me, like that would absolve him of the shit he put me through. It's okay son, it's okay. I said as he sniffled a bit. How about you come spend the day with me at the tower today eh? We can play some games, go to the training room, watch some movies make a day of it. Would you like that? The teary-eyed boy sniffled once, then regained his composure. Yay. He said while nodding. Okay, why don't you go inside and pack a change of clothes and whatever else you need to take, while I have a word with Auntie Grace here. Okay? Ryan nodded and walked briskly past Mallory into the house. I won't let you take him. Mallory said standing defiantly in front of me. I actually chuckled. Like you could do anything to stop me, and also I'm not taking him he's decided he wants to come with me, I'm not forcing him. I said with a smug smile. Now I want to know the name of the school he's attending and who his home teacher is. I asked crossing my arms in front of my chest. Mallory looked confused and taken aback by my question. School? She asked. I raised an eyebrow in response. Yes, school, you know the place where they teach you things, math, history, literature, you know school? I elaborated like she was dumb. He's not attending school, that would have been too risky too that immediately irked me, even though I knew the answer. So you're homeschooling him yes? I want your lesson plan, I need to know what where he's at. I pressed on. Well, uh, she stumbled. Yay, I bet this is not the conversation she was prepared to have. Death threats an exchange of promises of how we are going to stop each other and get Ryan back blah blah blah, all the good typical good versus evil crap, but not parenting and schoolwork. We are not exactly following a lesson plan. He's been following some courses on YouTube, he's a brilliant boy of course, he's my son. I cut her off sharply. But are you telling me that you're not letting him attend school to learn and socialize with children his age and you're also not teaching him at home? You're letting him spend ungodly amounts of time online without any structure or supervision. I was almost yelling at her, a few droplets of spit definitely reached her face. Are you kidding me? She actually looked quite guilty on that one. I calmed myself and let out a big sigh. Okay then who are his friends, what are their names and the contact info for their parents? Mallory regained her composure and stiffened herself once more. You know he's too dangerous, too strong to be around other kids, once wrong move, and he could, then show me what training program and exercises you guys have gone through to help him control his powers? I cut her off again because she was pissing me off. Even though I knew what the answer was I couldn't help the rage building up inside of me. Well, we haven't exactly practiced a lot, it was quite dangerous too, unfucking believable. I yelled over her. No school, no home teaching. No socializing with friends, no training to make sure he doesn't accidentally hurt someone, great, great fucking parenting. I said throwing my hands up in frustration. I don't even know what I expected from our so-called government agencies, maybe some fucking hard incompetence. God damn it Grace. I yelled out once more then stopped myself and rubbed the side of my head with my hands in frustration. I can see guilt building up in the deep creases of her weathered face. Good, feel bad you dumb bitch. I let a sense of amusement and laughter fill me up as I start chuckling. She looks at me concerned. You know what the irony is here. You, butcher and your government cronies are so scared Ryan's going to turn out a psychopath like me if I raise him, yet you're the ones doing more than I ever would to turning him that way. Jonah would be proud. I finished spitefully. 
I could now see the horror fully on her face as she realizes what she's been doing in her Dumbass attempt to keep Ryan locked up. If he doesn't learn to interact and care for the world, then you're just going to get a stronger and more cruel Homelander. Fucking idiots. His rough-skinned thumb absently traced the blue strap of the overalls to the button holding the outfit of the dark-skinned doll together. His fingers really moved with a mind of their own as they slowly fidgeted with the toy, and while his eyes were staring directly at the plastic face all M.M. could see were the scared eyes of his daughter. The scene constantly replayed in his head where he lost his cool and brutally knocked out Todd in front of her. He wanted to put the blame all on him, but deep down inside he knew he couldn't. He was the one who lost his cool when he had promised himself that he wouldn't. His lamentation and self-pity were broken by the squeaky sound of the door opening. Bonjour Frenchie said as he and Kamiko walked in, I got you something. He pulled out of his backpack a bottle of Starlight Fragrance perfume. Fuck is that? Cost three Bugattis worth of Starlight's money, but a dose of Novichok. Our weapon against soldier boy. M.M. flinched as he was touching the bottle. And the only fucking dose on the eastern seaboard. You put the world's deadliest nerve agent in a $10 bottle of Starlight's wish? He asked incredulously. I must say, the smell has improved. Frenchie remarked, while almost instantly Kamiko rolled her eyes. Great. Frenchie noticed the lack of excitement in his voice. So you lost your temper and hit a man. Oh, this is nothing. You know, I once took a Spaniard's ear for jabbering at a screening of 27 dresses Frenchie, my whole point has always been to keep my fucked up shit away from Janine. I lost control for one second, and for the rest of her life, she's gonna have an image of her daddy beating up her stepfather. M.M. said and paused briefly to inhale. I got to lock my shit down. I got to be stronger. Frenchie relaxed and leaned back on the couch sinking in his seat. Out of all man's miseries, the most bitter is this. To know so much he said with a faraway wistfulness filling his tone. And to control so little. I've read a fucking book, alright? M.M. remarked slightly annoyed and Frenchie scowled. You cannot keep the truth from your daughter that that you are a deeply broken. And fucked up man. M.M. started shaking his head, but then saw Kamiko rapidly move her hands forming signs too quick for him to pick up. Cheery says that you are also a very good man, loving man, who cares deeply about his family and his friends. Frenchie finished translating. Hey, I have to say that I agree, you are the best of man I have ever known. You just need to let Janine see all of that. M.M. sighed and leaned back in his chair. I'm not sure how to do that. He finally said and then put his hand up to cut the other two off from speaking. But thank you. I will work on it. He said resolutely. Now what about you two? How are you feeling? He asked them both though he mostly looked at Kamiko. After yesterday you getting your powers back? He gently asked. Good, good? Frenchie looked at him and then Kamiko, looking to get her confirmation. She signed away and shrugged her shoulders. She is good, no after effects that she can tell. Frenchie could see that M.M. was skeptical. You think something is wrong? His larger friend's mouth and nose twitched, and his hand went to rubbing his chin. I don't know. Something just doesn't feel right. He could have killed you both and blamed it on the Russians, and yet he lets you go and heals you, gives you your powers back. Why? That doesn't make sense. I know he hates us. They all looked at each other in silence until Frenchie shrugged. Maybe he's doing it for the publicity, minimize deaths now that he's the big man of Vought, or maybe he's just bored and wants to fuck with our heads. M.M. contemplated what he said, but still let skepticism further darken his features. Maybe, but I still have a feeling that he's up to something. He sighed and leaned back in his chair. Anyway if we want to use this. He said picking up the bottle, we need to find out where Soldier Boy is first. Well, with Mindstorm dead, the only one left is Monsieur Noir. So that means Mr. Charcuterie and Huey will be heading back here to restock, and then probably the tower. So we either get them at Butcher's Place or the tower. M.M. said. Regardless of where, the three of us are not enough, we need Starlight. He finished. The other two nodded in agreement. Ah son of I stopped myself before saying the B word as Ryan looked at me. Dot dot gun? He rolled his eyes at me. I know what you were going to say btch yay, well I get to say it because I'm the adult and I'm frustrated. 
I was in third and now I'm ninth. You see how it feels when you get hit by the ghost and the lightning and I'm also tiny. We all got hit by the lightning. He responded as his body twisted with the turn, hoping the controller would add a little edge. Yay, but you stayed in first. That's because I'm awesome. I'm going to win. Don't be so sure. I may not beat you, but the computer could get lucky, there's half a lap left. It took us over 4 hours to fly the over 1300 miles back to New York from Minnesota. I took my time and we had some father and son bonding moments while I taught him how to maneuver through the air. Dads teach their kids how to ride a bike I teach mine how to break the sound barrier. Honestly, we could have made way better time, but we took the scenic route as we were both enjoying ourselves. Plus Ryan simply wasn't dressed for supersonic flight, air drag was a bitch. The elevator chimed indicating Ashley and Deep were about to enter. I heard them coming from a mile away, figuratively speaking, since they were only a few dozen floors below me when I tuned in, but I was more interested in the other figure that was also making his way up the tower, Noir. There you are. Ashley said all excitedly. We've been looking for you the whole morning. Yay Deep nodded. I didn't bother standing and addressed them from the couch. Well as you can see I was busy. I set and launched the red turtle shell that would put me back in fourth place. With my son. I finished and put the controller down on the coffee table. Ryan won, by a decent margin as well. Ryan, say hello to Ashley, the CEO of Vought, she's very important, she's the boss of everyone in this building. I said with a smile. Hi. He said shyly. And this is Deep, Lord of the Seven Seas. Hey Deep responded. They were both looking quite awkward unsure what to say so I took the lead. So what is? Your speech from yesterday Ashley started. If you're going to ask me to go on talk shows again to explain myself, not going to happen. Starlight should have been enough for that, no, no, that's just it. She cut me off. It worked, they loved it, the people loved it. Uh, not everyone but mostly everyone. My brow rose signaling my curiosity and for her to elaborate. Working class white males 24 to 60 both rural and urban loved it. Blue collar folks loved it, working class moms loved it. Black Americans loved it. I mean truth, justice and the American way. You scored high even with college educated white collar workers. You nailed it out of the park. She said with a giant smile plastered on her face. I could see the excitement in her eyes. That whole bit about taking responsibility was fantastic. Women and mothers specifically loved that. Even our country, our people polled well, though some are saying that was a dog whistle to, well, you know who. She said as though whispering, putting her hand to the side of her mouth. But we can work with that. The rural folks ate it all up. Your ratings have never been higher, combined you and Starlight are now probably the most influential people in America if not on the planet. But the stock price dropped yesterday? Yes, yes, but it bounced back towards the end of the day, and it's almost at parity now to what it was before. Look the marketing team thinks we should, she didn't have a chance to finish as the new guest interrupted her. My features became stone cold. Noir, hey noir. Deep said surprised. I could tell the determination in his footsteps. I think, we should, uh, go. Ashley said. Wait. I halted their tracks. Ryan I said trying to sound as apologetic as possible to my son. I need some private time for a while to take care of some sensitive work things. Why don't you go with Deep, he can show you the crime analytics lab and all the cool computer stuff there. Right Deep? Deep looked at me and then at Ryan, and luckily he caught that my question was actually in order. Yay, yay of course. Crazy stuff, they can like predict crime almost before it happens. Ryan looked at me with a questioning look. It won't be long, I just need about an hour, and I'll catch up with you guys. He nodded and left with them. Noir didn't waste any time and unfolded his piece of paper. Soldier boy will come. We kill. It said. I looked directly at him, passed his helmet onto the real person behind the mask. His eyes were filled with hate and fear for soldier boy. I held the silence for a moment longer until I heard a slight spike in his heartbeat. Soldier boy has the power to weaken us, to kill us. I said and started to slowly circle Noir, my eyes never leaving him. He's more dangerous than anything we ever faced before. I said reaching his backside. Noir stood his ground but turned his body to face me. He nodded. 
In his misguided attempt for revenge, he has betrayed us, killed us, his own kind. I continued as I turned to the side completing the circle. I paused for a breath. Just in the same way he has betrayed you. An extra thump, the interruption of his rhythm told me everything I needed to know. I know what he did how he treated his team what he did to you. I said as I slowly walked until I was less than arm's length away. His rhythm gave all pretense of calm and was now thumping with anxious energy. I don't blame him. Those were hard memories for him. My hands went to his helmet, and he slightly flinched as his hands went up to stop me. I gave him a hard stare and said no. I want to see the real you. Strap and things are about to get super fucking gay in here, but I really need noir on my side. His hands dropped and let me remove his helmet. There he was in all his glory, a man that should be in his 70s, barely looked a day older than 30, that's if you ignored the rippling waves of jagged scarred skin, a shade lighter than his chocolate color, droopy white eye, and deformed healed over cranium. He looked grotesque as fuck in that I can't stop staring kind of way. He mutilated you, he hurt you, it was more than this, wasn't it? I said as my hand gently touched his scarred cheek. It was here as well my hand went to his chest, but most of all it was here. My hand went to his forehead. I hope he got that I didn't mean the scar tissue or literally the brain damage, but the mind itself. Luckily regardless of what he perceived it as, he nodded. My hands went and grasped his shoulders. I'll make him pay. That I promise you. He won't hurt you again. I won't let him. Not you and not anyone else ever again. I said strongly. His heart continued its energetic beat. I'll put my life on the line for you Noir, I looked him straight in the eyes. Out of everyone here, out of all of them you are the only one that is my equal, no more than that you are my brother. I said with as much heartfelt conviction as I could muster. I fought him Noir, I really did and he's strong, really strong. I said slowing my tempo. Only together we can beat him only together we can succeed, and not only him, everything else as well. The world is changing before our eyes, the media, the governments even our own kind are out there trying to hurt us, to bring us down, to not let us achieve our dreams. Make a vague appeal to the dreams and hope he once had, and how soldier boy stopped him. They want to hold us back, to kill us. My right hand suddenly grabbed the top of the back of his head, and in a jerky motion pulled it forward. The movement was too sudden for him to put any resistance, but it didn't matter as his momentum was stopped by my forehead lightly crashing into his. We were touching foreheads and our noses were hair breaths away. Yes super gay, I know. You're my brother and I'm going to put my life on the line for you noir, but I can't do this without you. My right hand was holding us together, while my left hand went palm open back to his chest and covered his heart. I need to know that you're my brother too, now and forever, I can't do this without you. I need to know Noir that you're with me. Not with Vought, not Stan not the government but with me all the way. I could literally feel his heart racing now, and I could smell his sweat pheromones all indicating a strong emotional response. Good, for the strong and silent type the show showed me how much of a mess Noir really was. People think they are all pure order and logic however the truth is we encode experiences and memories a lot better when there is an emotional response. And there is nothing like imprinting feelings of loyalty and brotherhood on one of the most deadliest people on the planet than when he is the most emotionally vulnerable. Case in point Noir's right hand went up to the back of my head and pushed us harder, while his left shot up to my chest mirroring me. I could feel the nodding movement of his head on my own, and I could smell the tears forming in his eyes. I maneuvered our position into a bro hug, gave him a few more reassuring words and broke apart. We need to talk strategy. I said solemnly and he nodded. For now Noir was mine. We have to stop them before they get to the tower. Annie said to the room. Our best bet is at Butcher's apartment. MM said while packing his gun and multiple armament supplies. Any answer from them? No, nothing from Huey, totally dark. Annie replied. Even if we get to them at the apartment. How do you propose we give the Novichok? Frenchie asked. You and Kamiko are not enough to hold Soldier Boy down, not if Huey and Mr. Charcuterie are doped up on V. We need more help. He remarked. What about Meve? Any chance we could get her on our side? M.M. asked Annie. The blonde paced around the messy living room. No, I saw her today. She's still recovering at the tower. She let out a big sigh. 
which is also why we need to stop them before they get to the tower. If he pulls another Harigasm thousands of people will die, Meave included. That Anshi paused side Homelander made it clear he'll kill Huey if he's still with Soldier Boy. Huey is a big boy. He's made his choice. M.M. remarked. The tone in his voice left no question that he resented what they did to him, and allying with the man that killed his family. Kamiko's hands burst in a flurry of movements. Chiri says he is still our friend. We need to help him even if he doesn't think he needs help. He would do it for us. Dada Frenchie stumbled, you know if he was thinking straight. M.M. just shook his head as if not believing what he was hearing. Well I can't say I fully agree, Frenchie remarked in his distinct accent, which immediately earned him a slap on the shoulder from Kamiko Aw. He said rubbing his shoulder oh, let me finish, I can't say I fully agree, but I understand his desperation to kill Homelander, it's really the same as you and Soldier Boy. Everything's gone wrong in his life since Homelander, uh, except you Starlight. M.M. stopped his packing as Frenchie's words registered. Him, Butcher and Huey were all just chasing the same thing really. His obsessiveness was the same, he'd almost done anything to get to Soldier Boy. Fine. We'll stake out the apartment. If they're there you all distract them, and I'll smash the Novichok in Soldier Boy's face. Kamiko immediately signed her hands in protest. No, she says, no. She will do it, if Soldier Boy hits her she can survive, you he will break, plus if you inhale the gas well uh that will be the end of that. M.M. looked at her and then at both Frenchie and Starlight. He could tell from their expressions they agreed with Kamiko, he was outnumbered. Fine. His body felt light as he walked to answer the door. The sweats and blurry vision were gone shortly after he re-upped on 24 volt, and he felt like he'd just hit the best home run of his life. The moment he opened the door the mild euphoric feeling was burst like a condom at a frat party. Annie. Uh, what are you doing? He didn't get to finish as M.M. turned the corner gun pointed right in his chin, immediately followed by Kamiko and Frenchie. Whoa, guys, what the hell? He said. Fuck me. Butcher said and put his scotch glass down. If it isn't the Brady Bunch. What are you lot doing here? What you think I didn't know where all the blind spots were? M.M. asked Butcher as he pushed Huey, gun to his chin further back in the room. You on V Huey? What happens if I pull the trigger? M.M. stop. Annie yelled. We're not here for them, it's soldier boy we want. Where is he? M.M. reluctantly put his weapon down. Annie guys Huey started whatever you were thinking of doing it's a bad idea. No Huey, what you're doing is bad. Thousands of innocent people work in Vought Tower, if Soldier Boy losses his shit they are all in danger. Who cares it's Vought fucking tower? Butcher said filled with spite. Becca worked in the tower. Frenchie replied automatically. Don't you dare bring up her name. Butcher replied. He's not going to lose his shit okay? We're only going after Homelander. Huey said amid the rising tensions. No we won't let you, I won't let you. Annie said resolutely as the light started to flicker and her eyes glowed yellow. Annie, please, we got this, we don't want to hurt you. Huey, his tone reluctant but his posture filled with 24 volt enhanced confidence. Oh, but I will the gruff voice said bringing everyone's attention to the new entrant in the room. A frozen moment of silence as everyone went through the decision process of what to do next. M.M. acted first. Annie now. He yelled. She gave Huey a reluctant look, then turned to Soldier Boy in attack mode, her arms already glowing. Kamiko had already launched herself the instant M.M. spoke towards him, hoping to get the timing right, and smashed the Novichok in his face, at the same instant Annie knocked him down. Time had slowed down for her as she was mid-air and ready to land on her victim. The knockdown never came as she saw a yellow stream of light hit Starlight knocking her off her feet. The slow motion perception reversed instantly as the unencumbered soldier boy moved faster than expected, punching her mid-air and launching her straight into the back wall, using both his and her momentum against her to land a devastating blow that left her gasping for air. The deadly perfume launched out of her hand. Kamiko. Frenchie yelled. Annie. Huey echoed him, and they both jumped to check on them. Butcher what the hell. Huey started, but Butcher cut him off. Oh, grow some bollocks. She's a soup, barely a scratch on her. To his point Annie was already stirring. Now the rest of you, whatever you were thinking of doing ain't going to happen. So off into the vault with you or else soldier boy here will rip your arms off, 
and I'm not sure I can stop him. MM looked at him with burning rage in his eyes, every instinct told him to shoot him, but his rational brain told him it was futile. This battle was lost. If they had caught them before dosing they may have stood a chance. We tried to stop them, soldier boy is coming to you. You have to evacuate the tower. We're almost there. I paused the message and looked at my crew waiting to see what they would say. Ashley looked like she was about to have a heart attack, and A-Train looked unsure and conflicted. The Deep was conveniently giving Ryan a tour of the studio at this time. Of course none of them knew I had planned for Butcher and Soldier Boy to arrive around this hour. Luckily they were punctual. What do we do? Is he actually coming here? Ashley asked, desperation evident in her tone. I resisted the urge to roll my eyes. Of course he is. You heard our dearest co-captain, we need to evacuate the building. I replied with a tinge of sarcasm. Ashley, you and A-Train will see to the evacuation. I will go get Deep and my son. I said and stood paused briefly and turned to A-Train. A-Train this will be an excellent opportunity for you to ear brownie points with, well, everyone, but more than that I need you to represent the seven tonight. They need to see that you're back, that we have this under control. You have to make sure everyone in the building gets out safely. He was honestly looking at me confused. The past few days we actually had very little contact, and he was a bit behind on my sudden change of nature so to speak. I didn't let him express his opinion and just continued talking. Ashley will be officially in charge, but in we both know in moments of panic, people are going to look to you. So I need you to work together with her got it? Yay, he nodded reluctantly. And I don't want you anywhere near soldier boy, he's extremely dangerous and you aren't at full strength yet. If you see him do not engage. Got it. I didn't want a train anywhere near this fight, so sticking him with evacuation duty and crowd control was a good idea. This was going to be a life and death situation, and I simply didn't trust a train to have my back, not yet at least. One on one I could take him no problem, but while facing soldier boy, butcher and Huey, no way was I going to risk having a super fast knife at my back. The man gave a confused and reluctant nod and went out with Ashley to ensure the building evacuation. They say in life timing is everything so I conveniently took my time to get to Deep and Ryan and managed to stall just enough that Soldier Boy, Huey and Butcher met us as we were going out. Both Ryan and Butcher looked surprised. Ryan. Butcher said. What are you doing here? I put a hand on my son's shoulder as he was standing in front of me. My son I said making sure to accentuate is staying with me. I paused. Butcher made to say something, but I cut him off. Did you know he wasn't allowed to go to school? A boy his age, not allowed to have friends, to socialize, to learn. What kind of person would do that, deprive him of the joys of childhood, all because of who he was? What kind of cruel man would do that to him? Hide him from the world like that? I asked rhetorically. Ryan, you need to, he didn't finish his sentence as soldier boy's gruff voice cut him off. Where's Noir? My gaze turned to him. Dead. I killed him. As soon as the words left my mouth I felt Ryan twitch and look up at me. I squeezed his shoulder with my hand in response. He stopped himself from saying anything and only gave me a troubling look. Yes son. Yes. Good. Yes Echo, he's a smart boy, he understood my signal no to say anything. I was happy about it not because it would have ruined my plans, no, they would work just as well even revealing that Noir was alive from the beginning. I was happy because him not saying anything meant he was giving me the benefit of the doubt, he was starting to trust me more and more. Why? Because he didn't tell me about you. I replied firmly, then squeezed Ryan's shoulder again. Ryan, meet your grandfather, soldier boy, heroes of heroes and my father. Ryan looked confused at me and then at soldier boy. He's my grandfather? Oh yes, he's the reason me and you are so strong. We inherited it from him. I said with a cold smile while Ryan just looked conflicted. Butcher and Huey looked at soldier boy, only to see a questioning gaze perched on his features. He ain't your kid. Butcher reiterated loudly. Yes I am. I responded calmly. I'm your kid and this is your grandson. You have a real family. We don't have to fight. I just want to talk. Whatever Butcher told you or whatever deal Butcher offered you is not real. Surrender yourself now and I promise you won't do more than five years in prison. I said firmly. 
You were betrayed by your team, by Vaud and by your government, the Midtown explosion was an accident, a soldier suffering from PTSD nothing more. We can play that up in the media and with my power, with Vaught's power, you won't stay more than five years in prison. I said with passion in my tone. Join me, join us and we can be unstoppable, but you have to end it here and now. Join me, dad. I did my best to sound passionate and heartfelt as I was lying through my teeth. No fucking way was I going to let a loose cannon like Soldier Boy run loose, plus I had already promised Noir I would end Soldier Boy. If he accepted then I hoped to knock him out with a surprise attack, but that was a small chance. Still, for optics purposes I had to give the offer. Can't have people saying I didn't try peace first. Don't listen to him. Butcher replied. He's lying. He then turned his gaze to Ryan. Ryan you have to leave, leave the building. I just snorted at him. See Ryan, this is what William does, he pitches father and son against each other, hoping we kill one another. He'll pretend to be your friend just so he can turn you against me. That's how deep his hate runs for us. Ryan don't listen to him, you need to get out of here now. I ignored him butcher and turned back to soldier boy. Soldier boy dad choose peace and surrender for the sake of your son and grandson. The attention was now back on him. His head tilted to his right and his left eye twitched while his gaze stayed locked on me. No he said and took a step forward. You're lying, Noir isn't dead. I let out the breath that I was holding. Violence it is. Kill him. We will echo we will. I see. I replied and paused for a split second, my hearing picking up Annie and her crew coming up. Huh, they made excellent timing and somehow avoided the police perimeter, then again she probably pulled the starlight car. Smart. I pulled myself out of my thoughts and turned to Deep who had been silent and pale the whole time. Deep I say bringing his attention to me. Take Ryan and evacuate the building. I will not have my son in danger. To my surprise the boy pushed my arm away in anger no. I'm staying here with you. Damn son. Now is not the time to be a hero. No son, remember our discussion about situations you shouldn't be in? This is one of those. I need you to go with deep end. I didn't manage to finish my sentence as a vice-like grip suddenly grabbed me by the throat. Fuck. No let go of him. Ryan shouted. Where is he? Where's Noir? Soldier boy shouted as his vice-like grip was holding me by the upper neck and jaw. One moment of distraction that's all it took and he was on me. Butcher and Huey didn't waste one moment and they grabbed my hands. Ryan, you need to leave, get out of the building. Butcher yelled at him. Where is he? Soldier boy shouted and started to glow. Ryan leave now. No leave him alone. The little boy yelled and pulled furiously at Butcher's arms. Deep you fucking useless shit do something. The moron was frozen in shock. I could feel the radiation permeating weakening me. A-H-H-H-H. A large red beam hit soldier boy's abdomen, knocking him to the side and stopping his beam of death. Luckily his radiation was affecting Butcher and Huey as well. I instantly threw both Huey and Butcher off me. They were soups, but they weren't close to my level, not without the element of surprise. I knew what was coming and in slow motions I saw Soldier Boy rush shield first towards Ryan. Protect him. My mind went into overdrive and my body acted on its own. In an instant I disappeared from my stop and appeared in front of Ryan taking the brunt of the shield. Normally Soldier Boy's momentum would have toppled me launching me into Ryan crashing us into a mess of limbs, tables, chairs and walls, but there was nothing normal about me. I can fly and create my own momentum without actually moving a physical muscle. Bang. The shield hit me with a loud echoing bang, my body tensed absorbing the energy, and my invisible flight muscle instinctually created the opposite force required to stop him and not crash into Ryan. My feet buckled and indented the cement floor and soldier boy's shield bent under the immovable pressure of my body. A-H-H-H-H. I used his moment of surprise to overpower him and push him backward again. Deep. Take Ryan now. The discount Aquaman regained his senses and forcibly hoisted Ryan by the waist. The boy made to protest, but Deep was too strong, and with a few lunges he was halfway down the stairs. I didn't waste any time as Soldier Boy was getting himself unstuck from a pile of cubicle walls and desks. I flew straight into Huey to his surprise and buried my left in his gut. 
Rule number one when fighting multiple opponents knock out the weak ones first to prevent them from hitting you from behind, and even the numbers. I felt my fist crushing his sternum and ribs the force lifting him off the ground, then used my powerful right hook to knock him on the side of the head. The same combo that took out Meave, though probably not as powerful. He'll probably survive thanks to the V, but he won't be getting up anytime soon. I raise my guard up just in time, so Butcher's beam hits my forearms knocking me back a bit. Huey. He yells but doesn't have time to check on the surrogate of his little brother, as a flying kick hits him in the back knocking him down. Noir. A recovered soldier boy yells. God damn, he has impeccable timing. He's just so bloody competent that I need to have him on my side. With the Huey out of the way it was safe for Noir to come out of his hiding spot and even the odds. You see as a teleporter Huey presents a unique danger to anyone that can't fly. At any point in time he could have teleported Noir right outside the building, and considering we are over 60 floors up, I doubt even Noir would get back up after that kind of fall. That would leave me in a position which is not great, so regardless of how I played this Huey was always the first one that had to go. Noir. I yell back at him. You take care of Butcher I'll take Soldier Boy. I rush daddy dearest with a straight left which he dodges with a duck under my flying form. I feel his body spring up in an uppercut to catch me straight in the abdomen, but roll away to my left mid-flight like a turbine and avoid it, landing to his right. As my feet touch down my hands instantly raise to block a roundhouse kick. I step in with my right and straight kick him in the chest with my left, pushing him back and giving me a second to breath. From the corner of my eye I catch Noir exchanging blows with Butcher and skillfully evading his laser yes even from up close. Hmm, something to keep in mind for the future. Homelander. My gaze is distracted by Starlight's voice and my world is rocked by Soldier Boy's right. Idiot. My vision goes blurry as my body slams into and immediately bounces off the floor away from Soldier Boy. Fucking hell that hurt. I was so concentrated on Soldier Boy for a moment her voice surprised me. Noir. You traitorous coward. With a kick Noir threw Butcher of him, but Soldier Boy was already advancing with that eerie red glow. MM unloaded a shotgun into his face which did little to nothing as the Dean Winchester look-alike barely flinched. Kamiko rushed him with furious animalistic blows, but he was too fast and skillfully blocked the first hit, then caught her arm on the second hit, and in one smooth motion broke it and pushed her away. Fucking hell the man was a tank. Even in my dazed state I could tell Noir was panicking as instead of his normal confident movements, he was backing away in a stuttering step. Not him. Get Homelander. I heard Butcher say as he was drunkenly standing up. Yay, Noir definitely knocked his shit around. How many seconds has it been? I needed to move before he explodes. I took a deep breath and made to launch myself at him when the lights started flickering. Starlight's body starts glowing, and with a scream she launches her gathered energy at Soldier Boy, which I can only guess due to surprise pushes him back, interrupting his power-up moment, though he remains on his feet. Fucking hell she really needs to work on charging up that power faster. It would have been better if she body rushed him. Ah. Enough. No more interference. Soldier Boy recovers just as fast turning towards Starlight, his body resuming his death glow brighter than before. I see the look of horror on Annie's face and act. Annie. I scream as I launch myself at the glowing hero. My flight stops me just as I grab him from behind. I can't go forward, there's too much building that way, I can't risk him toppling the tower. Number 9 eleventh's on my watch. My eyes briefly meets hers, and I instantly launch myself backwards through where the windows behind me and up. My whole body is hugging him, I feel the radiation seep into me, intensifying, burning me. A-H-H-H. I hear him scream and I let go. A second that's all I had to put distance between us. His twisting body released the energy in a wide red beam, clipping the tops of the tower and a few other buildings around us. I hadn't cleared enough space. Two long seconds, an eternity. That's how long it took for the beam to subside, his body still traveling upwards from pure momentum. I felt my breathing, my body was hot with sweat, the blow to the head affecting me more than it should. Fucking radiation. Still now wasn't the time to rest. My vision zoned in on soldier boy he looked dazed. I launched myself towards him picking up as much speed as I could. Boom. 
I break the sound barrier just as I hit him full force. This hurts us both. Me due to the radiation and him because he wasn't expecting it. I don't break apart but continue my momentum with him, tackling him football style, pushing us higher and higher in the atmosphere picking up speed. This is my chance while he is dazed, I need to gather speed and push him off planet. If I can't kill him there's no way I'm letting a government agency get the once weapon that could kill me. I push faster and harder, past Mach 1, 2 dot dot 3. I use the bright glow of the moon to guide me. Aaaahh, let go. Like thunder I feel a blow rocking my back, then an elbow in the back of my head. You piece of shit let go. I ignore him and the pain, but then I feel the heat that blasted heat, I feel it exciting the radiation inside of me. 1110 my right hand is holding him firmly secure to me, so I use my left to deliver powerful kidney blows, hoping to stop his charge up. Each blow he lands on me weakens me further. I push harder. It's hard to concentrate. How many seconds have passed? He needs 12. 7 6 I feel the heat intensify my shoulder burning, each breath I take stings. 5 with a mighty push I untangle us, but not before he lands another right on my head which dazes me again. We break apart like two ragdolls, and like a giant Sith lightsaber his beam spins wildly with him. 3, 4, 5 seconds I take to regain my sense. Ironically his hit pushed me out of the way of the death beam. The air is cold and thin, but I feel burns on my neck, bubbling skin on my chest, the top of my burned away, partially melted in my flesh. My instincts tell me to stop, to rest, but I can't do that, not yet. I'm so close. I see him, his momentum slowing and rush towards him one more time. I have to get him past low orbit, past the IS, past the point where it will be easy for the government to get him. I crash again into him carrying us further out, using every bit of energy I have to break us away from the gravity of this planet. I get a few more seconds of respite than the first time, he's taking longer to recover as well, he's more tired. Good but I know in a fight of attrition I'm the loser so I push even harder. I must be going past Mach 8 now. When suddenly a shock goes through my spine as I feel a deep blow to the back of my head. The pain is so sudden my grip loses on him, and we become tangled flying mess. I can't slow down, I have to push up. I grab him by the remaining fabric of his suit and continue propelling us upwards. I'll kill you. You sniveling piece of shit. Only through the corner of my eye I catch a glowing red fist my head turns with the punch, but even I feel its shattering strength. My jaw is cracked and my right cheek is burned. This fucker is a genetic beast. His powers are evolving right in front of me. He was channeling his energy through his fists. We're past the atmosphere now. It's easier to accelerate so I put energy into another burst. I manage to knee him in the side and shift around to grab him by the throat with my left. His glowing left hand swings to hit me in the side of the head, but I manage to partially block it with my right. I relax my block thinking his hand was going to retreat. A mistake, instead he pushes further. His glowing left hand grabs the right side of my face burning me, seeping radiation into my brain, his thumb finds my eye and digs in. I desperately try to release his grip, but my blows are weak, my energy being used to accelerate us further. My mouth opens in a silent scream, we are past the atmosphere no, air for sound to travel. I feel his thumb burning my eye. I can see he's holding his breath, but how long can he do it for? He needs to breathe, but so do I. I need to fly back before we both pass out. I try to disentangle, but the fucker won't let go. Pain. Stop him. Kill him. Then fucking help me. You think I'm not trying. You know this body better than I do. Help me. My mind goes into overdrive as I hear echo. Or maybe I'm just hallucinating from the pain. When did soldier boy's body start glowing again? How many seconds? Fuck, this isn't how it was supposed to go down. My thoughts run back to the image of the truck that hit me, its glaring bright headlights shining the light of death upon me. With my left eye I see soldier boy's eyes are bloodshot no, they are glowing red, his mouth is open, and the dreaded light comes from there as well. I almost resign to my fate when I suddenly feel a heat in my stomach, energy building and a hallowing thought echoing through my whole being. Together as one. The energy surges and I feel strength in my limbs. I forcefully push his glowing hand away from my face. Release, sweet release. 
I made to punch him, but it's too late he's detonating. This is it life and death, standing at the edge, my vision focused, my perception slows down all around soldier boy, I see a wave of red energy burst in his sphere all around him. A beam I could have dodged, but an omnidirectional wave I have nowhere to go. This fucker he evolved his powers right in front of me, live or die, then so can I I force the energy built in my belly outward, I only have a split of a second, so I push with every fiber of my being to flood every cell of my body and break free, I feel it encompassing me, just as soldier boy's wave hits me. The ensuing blast from the two forces violently meeting blasts us apart, adding to his momentum and slowing mine down. I feel dazed and drained, but I'm alive. I can't help but silently chuckle. It worked it actually worked. It had to work, otherwise the harsh mistress that is space would have killed me. I did it. I won. It takes me a few seconds to zone in on soldier boy with my left eye. He's passed out, probably not dead, but he needs air to breathe which he doesn't have anymore. So he's unconscious. Hahaha. <laughs> have fun flying into the moon at over Mach 10 fucker. Ahhh. With the adrenaline rush gone the pain is coming back. My right eye is fucked, my face is a mess, I see melted flesh and bubbling skin, and as I feel an all-knowing impulse hit my brain, I realize I also need to breathe. Fuck so much pain. I reverse course and head to earth at the maximum speed I can muster. In a few seconds I'll reach the atmosphere just have to hold on until then. My vision gets blurry, and I see colorful spots in front of my eyes. I feel the pull of gravity stronger as the world around me brightens. I try to breathe, but the air is still too thin, so I push faster. The air around me starts to glow red and orange. I try once again to take a breath, but I mostly get fire. Fuck I'm going to fast now. I will myself to slow down, but I can't tell if I'm flying or just free falling now. The exhaustion, pain and lack of air is simply too much. With my last gasps of consciousness I will my eyes to focus and zoom in on New York, and will myself to aim for a landing there. Darkness overtakes me. Through heavy blinks, glowing rays of white lights assault the eyes only interrupted by a dark pixelated shape that was slowly getting bigger and bigger. Muffled sounds reach the ears and as the head moves and feeling returns, there is a realization of a pressure surrounding the mouth and nose, a mask covering the face. The right hand shoots to remove the obstructing device, but the shadowy figure stops it. No, no not yet Reina, it will help you wake up. The words barely register, but with each blink the image comes into focus, and with each breath she feels energy coursing through her veins. It only takes her a moment to regain her strength, and her hand shoots to grab the wrist of the now visible man in green scrubs, pressing the mask on her face. Ah. The man screamed and tried to jerk it out of her vice-like grip. Please stop me if you're hurting me. Please stop. With enough energy regained her upper body shoots up throwing the mask off, looking wildly around. Who are you? Where am I? She asked the almost whimpering man. Reina, please. You're hurting me. We're in Vought Tower, medical floor, 72. He said through labored breaths that only worked to accentuate his Spanish accent. She released the man's wrist which he immediately jerked close to him letting out a huge breath. I'm Carlo, Carlo Perez, your nurse. He said regaining his breath. Meave looked at him confused and then looked around at the setup of the room resembling a hospital room equipped with various machines, some hooked up with stickies to her, monitoring her condition. What happened? She asked uncertainly which drew a brief look of confusion from Carlo. You don't remember? You had an accident fighting, you and Mr. Homelander. As soon as the words left his mouth a rush of images and memories flooded her mind. He hit you hard on the head and broke your ribs, big mess. Her hand went to her head as if bracing herself to better withstand the memory. They were sparring, her body remember each blow was heavy, the pain reverberating like thunder striking. They were moving fast, faster than she'd moved before, and then pain in her gut like a shock. Her breath was gone and pain in the side of her head. What happened after the fight how badly was I hurt? Why can't I remember anything? Ah, see it was pretty bad, the sternum, ribs were broken and bruised organs, but those healed up in two days, no problem it was the blow to the head, they had to put you in a coma for a few days. Coma? See, cracked cranium, big bruise on the temple. 
There was a big fight between Dr. Schiffler and Ferelli on whether they should try to cut you open, at his words, Neve's eyes went wide, and her hand went to her head, everything felt normal to let the brain swell just in case, but Dr. Schultz agreed with Dr. Ferelli, and they only put you in a coma and treat you with ice and anti-inflammatory medication. How long have I been out? Five days, Raina you were supposed to be woken up yesterday, but the doctors were all busy short-staffed, not many people wanted to come in because of the contamination the radiation and the damage to the building. Meve looked even more confused. Ah, uh, right, before your accident you remember the Midtown terrorist? Her eyes widened in realization, Soldier Boy. Turns out it was Soldier Boy, come back from the dead. He was killing supers, wanted to take down the company and the government for betraying him or something. He and Mr. Homelander had a big fight, big mess, top of the building is destroyed, radiation warning for our block. Meath listened to his words sharply, though she felt as if he was talking about another world. The 50th floor where the studio is and 10 floors below and above are closed off, they say the radiation is the highest there. Some of the buildings around us got hit pretty bad, they evacuated the most of them. Meave almost not believing what she was hearing stood and in a daze, went to the bright windows and looked out at the surrounding skyscrapers. Devastation. Tops looked like they had been wrecked by a bulldozer, steel beams sticking out, cement dripping, and smoke rising from the hidden fires. She saw Carlo shake his head in sorrow, many died, were working late, and from the building materials falling on the street. He paused briefly. They offered us big bonus to come in, the doctors were desperate, said our building was secure. As her eyes wandered from building scanning the damage of what she could only assume was a hard fight, she caught a blob of dark on the ground. Her eyes shifted course and focused there only to realize it was a large gathering of people. What's happening down there, why is that mob of people gathered here? She asked the middle-aged nurse who joined her by the window. Oh, Miss Ashley called them, they come to support Senor Homelander. Meave looked at him, her features frowning in confusion. She say Homelander for its soldier boy and push him into space to save the city. They say he fell down in a ball of fire like a falling angel. Carlo paused. A spike of emotion surged within Meave. The government they came, try to take him away he was hurt very badly, his tone started to get soft. I only saw him briefly in the operating room it was bad Reina, very bad he said solemnly. Could this be it? Could this be the end of Homelander? The cocktail of emotions being released made her anxious and hopeful. And the government his voice rising in anger, the CIA, NSA or FBI, you know those agent types he said with disgust, those penjos they try to take him when he's weak, they came with guns, armed to the teeth they try to take him like he's the criminal. Like he didn't just save New York, Meave saw Carlo slightly turn his head and mutter some Spanish under his breath then, as if realizing who he was talking to caught a hold of himself. What happened to him? Where is he? She asked suddenly agitated. Don't worry Reina, it didn't work. The heroes they banded together and stopped them. He said with a small smile. Miss Ashley and Elnoir rallied them and stopped the agents. They say the agents came all the way to the operating room, but Elnoir beat all of them back to outside the building, then Miss Ashley, she sent out the call on the internet, and the people came to protest them. They've been outside ever since. He said his smile bigger than before. And Homelander? What happened where is he? Is he okay? The anxiety was surging more now. Carlo's face turned solemn again. We don't know Reina. He's been on the floor above, the doctors were with him for the past day. Dr. Schultz and Miss Ashley won't let anyone in, El Noir is keeping guard. Miss Starlight, El Rapido and Deep are with the others outside, making sure the agents don't riot again. She looked at Carlo, the anxiety and anticipation was too much she needed to find out. Briskly she turned around and bolted for the door. Reina. Reina. She heard the confused shouts of the nurse, but she didn't bother turning back, he heart was thumping. She needed to see him she needed to see if she could end this. This may be her only chance while he was weak. She burst through the stairwell door and leaped the whole flight in one go, and then did it again for the second. Her frantic strength almost ripped the handles off the doorway, and she paused briefly to get her bearings in the hallways. She rushed to her right and turned left where she was halfway through the hallway noir standing in front of a double set of doors. Her gaze briefly met his mask, and with anxious conviction she strode towards him. 
His right hand lifted up in a stop sign. Move or I'll break every bone in your body. She commanded. She could take him, she thought, she could overpower him, it wouldn't be easy, but she'd done it once before. Meave prepared herself to pick up speed as Noir settled into a defensive stance. This was it. Her body dropped slightly ready to rush him, but her momentum was stopped by the squeak of the door behind him. As she briefly stopped to ask as those coming out her anxiousness turned to her surprise into shock. First there was someone in a white lab coat she didn't recognize, then followed Dr. Schultz, but they weren't what shocked her that was the third person behind them. White bandages around his head covering his right eye, his right cheek riddled with grotesque red wavy scarred skin, obvious sign that something or in this case someone had managed to melt part of his face off. The scarring extended down to the bottom of his neck, where another set of bandages could be seen encompassing his torso under the all too large hospital gown. She could only stare in shock at the state of Homelander, as he briskly walked past Noir towards her, and promptly grabbed her in a bear hug, though she noticed a bandaged up right hand was barely squeezing, and seemed all too skinny to be one that knocked her brains around just a few days ago. Meave. I'm so glad you're here. John said loudly. He was followed by a chorus of voices, that in the few seconds she was taken by his appearance had multiplied to more people like Ashley her assistant and a few others, all saying her name and agreeing with Homelander. She had come here for a purpose, but realizing the moment had come and gone, Meave did the only thing she could. What surprised her was the felling calm emptiness that was filling her up with each breath, as she reciprocated the embrace, and even resting her head on his shoulders in resignation. John was smiling. I greedily drank out of the glass, and with each gulp the refreshing liquid cooled the fiery feeling I felt inside of me. As I finished slurping the last drops of water I handed the glass back to Martin and let out a satisfied sigh. Thank you. I really needed that. I looked inside the large gown I was wearing to stare at the bandages that were covering me from the waist up to the neck. I felt weak, fatigued, each breath was heavy, muscles screaming of being sore, as if they had been pressing against an unstoppable force, though admittedly the pain numbed a little bit with each rising of my chest. I raised my bandaged right hand barely able to bring it to shoulder level. I had to turn my head slightly more to the right to get a good look. I couldn't see out of my right eye no correction I couldn't feel my right eye, only a throbbing sensation of pain like a drumbeat following the rhythm of my heart. My right hand was too thin even with the bandages I felt no strength in it. Martin I'm seated halfway up on the bed and my head turns to him. What happened? The older man sitting in a chair next to my bed, sighed and leaned back. I'm not going to lie to you it was pretty bad. For a little while we thought we were going to lose you. I was actually taken aback by his words, I knew I had been in bad shape, but not close to dying. I motioned for him to continue. You fell in Harlem, busted up some buildings on your way down, it was only pure luck that we got to you before the police then again, most of them were evacuating the affected neighborhoods neighborhoods? I interrupted him. Ah, well more like a few of the city blocks around us, soldier boys laser beam wrecked a few buildings a bunch of people died evening workers and falling debris and all that. He said almost as an afterthought. We also have a radiation warning for about five blocks all around us, he saw me scrunch the visible part of my face in worry, that's mostly for show. Don't worry none of the buildings came down. He paused. Okay, you said I fell in Harlem? I nudged for him to continue. Yay, you were a mess, burns all over you, melted skin and suit, bruising and bleeding well from everywhere. I could feel his weariness at bringing up the images of how he found me. We brought you back, the medical team was ready to operate, we did what we could to help you, but broken as you were for the first three hours we couldn't penetrate your skin. He paused briefly. You were as sturdy as ever, problem was you weren't healing or mending back together, then around the 3 hour mark suddenly you heated up and started emitting large amounts of radiation. We weren't sure what was going to happen so we evacuated and only observed you. He paused briefly once more. That lasted about 40 minutes, then our instruments indicated you had cooled down and the radiation reduced to, well, more, reasonable levels. That's when we came back and found we were actually able to cut you my eyes immediately widened in shock, so we started to fix you. My hands immediately shot up in front of me, and as if reading my mind Martin answered my question. Don't worry you're still super I think. 
Not waiting for him to elaborate I took a breath and willed myself up off the bed, instantly I felt myself rise above it, though I felt pain from my muscles, trying to stabilize my core. Well that confirms it you can still fly, and you're at least still very much invulnerable again. As I plopped down on the bed I looked at him confused and waited for him to elaborate. We operated for about 12 hours straight, stopping internal bleeding, skin grafts, setting bones the whole works. He says. You were losing quite a lot of blood, so we had to get you some new ones also to counteract the radiation damage we needed to do a bone marrow transplant, bone marrow, but from where I interrupted him, I don't have anyone then it hit me. Ryan we both said at the same time. I instantly felt an energy surge in my belly and my whole body heating up. My right arm weak as it was shot up to grab him by the throat, and machines in the room started beeping wildly in that radio static sound, indicating high levels of radiation. Martin's eyes bulged as my thump pressed against his throat box, but he managed to squeeze out a few words that claimed me down. He's fine. Completely fine. He said through choking breaths. I let him go and I put my face in the same right palm that was just squeezing him. I'm sorry Martin, I'm so sorry. I just it's fine, it's okay. You've been through a lot. He said rubbing his neck. Ryan is okay, perfectly fine, his healing factor is outstanding, and everything we took here regenerated back in a few hours. He's truly a fine specimen. I immediately shot him a glare and he put his hands up in resignation. Sorry, poor choice of words. So his bone marrow healed me? I asked and I saw him shift a bit uncomfortably. Hey we're not quite sure I looked at him incredulously. You're not sure? Well, his blood and bone marrow were needed since, well you needed it, and he was the only compatible donor, but we also used stem cells from him, along with a concoction he hesitated a bit experimental of course, of subject black stem cells and compound V. And that's what worked to bring me back? To being super? And once again I saw the man hesitate. A not exactly, uh, I think maybe, that's the best theory we have he said rapidly as he saw my unamused look. I had hoped the V would restore you immediately like it did for Subject Black, but that didn't happen. So what happened then? Well, we performed the transfusions around the 8 hours of operating once the other team managed to finish extracting from Ryan and synthesizing the Black V compound, but well once we did it, nothing happened. He took a deep breath. As far as we could tell your body just kind of fully absorbed everything with no discernible changes. Your temperature was still hot and the radiation was still high abnormal. Your healing and blood coagulation was normal human levels as far as we could tell. So what happened then? Well seeing no perceptible change, we continued with the operation, we fixed as much as we could, and called it quits when we couldn't, 12 hours in. Then how am I still super? I asked confused. Well, we did a pinprick test every hour or so after we were done to check you, and in the fourth hour after Dr. Forelli reported that it failed, and all the things we had hooked you up to were expelled from your body. He took a slight breath and continued. Most of the sutured wounds were healed over, and the burned areas showed considerable scarring as well there was considerable growth of skin and muscle on your damaged right arm. He paused slightly as I looked at my bandaged arm. Since then we haven't been able to penetrate your skin, all the medicine had to be administered orally or annually. I flinched at that last part, but whatever he was the doctor he knew better. Your eye though didn't regenerate, we had to remove the remains, but the area around it had already started to scar when we found you in Harlem he said. But overall the more important part was that you had cooled down to normal human temperature, and the radiation subsided as well at least until you just got angry now. He said and took a look at the machines near us. I sighed. So you used me as a guinea pig for your new untested compound, and don't even know if it worked or not. Martin scowled and I could see he wasn't pleased with my assessment. I'm giving you the short notes here, you have no idea how bad you were, even the video won't do justice to show you, but I can read you the chart of all the things that were wrong with you, I stopped him before he could go on. No that won't be necessary. You're right. I'm sorry and thank you for saving my life. The man loosed up and nodded in acknowledgement. Look, I need a few moments to recollect and let all of this sink in. I said while my hand motioned at my state. Martin nodded once again. I can give you half an hour. 
Ashley and the exec team along with the board want to see you ASAP, and there's only so long I can keep Schiffler and Ferelli of you. Now that you're awake they will want to run tests on you. I rolled my eyes at that. HNHM, does Ashley have anything to do with the crowd outside? You can hear them? Martin asked back. How can I not I said shrugging. That's good. It means that healed as well and yes she does, I'll let her tell you about that, fucking government pricks. He swore under his breath, and I just raised my remaining eyebrow at him. Never mind that. He said shaking his head. Washrooms over there through that door if you need it. Moir's outside call for him when you're ready. I nodded and the man left me to my own devices. I walked slowly to the washroom, with each step getting reacquainted with the feel of my body. That and I was trying to minimize the lingering pain. I looked at the half mirror in the washroom and it wasn't pretty. Scarred red skin on the right side of my face, even though it was hidden by the bandages I knew part of my hair was also gone. The scarring went down my neck to my shoulders where the bandages began again. Part of me wanted to unwrap them to see the damage however I felt a surge of anger as I stared at myself in the mirror. Homelander's feelings were bubbling up, the man was had been a supremacist and took great pride in his perfect looks. Seeing them now ruin must have risen whatever was left of him inside of me. I felt heat and energy build more wild, chaotic and much hotter than when I used my laser vision, no, this was something different. I heard the instruments in the other room start beeping, making static noises. As the heat and energy built my breathing got faster, and I saw in the mirror my chest glowing red. With almost frantic breathing I realized what was happening. I needed to get it under control before I exploded. I inhaled deeply through my mouth and exhaled in a controlled manner through my nose. Fuck this I'm in charge. I did it again and again while slowly pushing the energy through my whole body, circulating it as if were blood, with each breath. I felt my heart rate slow and with it the energy build up along with the glowing in my chest. I brought my hands up in front of my one good eye, took a deep breath through my nose, and as I exhaled slowly, I willed the energy to move into my arms. Immediately I felt heat from my stomach through my chest running down my arms. I scowled, took another breath, sharpened my will and tried again with the same effect. I did it again and as I finished my controlled exhaled I couldn't help but let a smile build upon my chapped lips. Like father like son. My palms were glowing with a bright deep red aura. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.